take a look at this. Um, coherence states how consistent the phase of a wave is over time or space. And we can talk about two types of coherence, a temporal or time coherence and a spatial or space coherence. And remember that our phase relationship, of course, is defined as having a temporal and a spatial component. Uh, no problems there. We we've, we've hopefully have understood the phase a little bit better by now. And one would expect, for example, if you were to ha turn on an electronic source, say a frequency generator or a function generator, and you were to measure the phase of the sine wave it put out at some particular time, and you knew the frequency, um, you could say, okay, the phase is this at this time, and if I come back at some later time and I know the frequency, I should be able to tell what value it's putting out, what voltage it's putting out, because I know the frequency, I know the phase, I can calculate that as far as I need to in the future. But you would actually be very surprised if you came back a year later and you found exactly the voltage value that you expected. Because you expect there to be some kinds of errors, drift, that frequency is not going to stay really fixed. And that's what we mean by coherence, that a perfect sine wave tends to drift and not stay coherent. So let's took a look at a coherent being first, because you're, you should be fairly familiar with this. It says, if you know the phase, as I just said, at one point in time, and you know the frequency, you can, of course, extrapolate to what the phase will be at some other later point in time. And that's temporal coherence. Um, in spatial coherence, it means if there's a wave at this location that has a well-defined phase, the waves at other locations in space also have clearly and well-defined phases. There is a relationship uh, between the phase of the wave at one place in space and the wave at another place in space. For an incoherent beam, uh, this is what we get. Um, in time, it's a sine wave that has little jumps. Maybe your function gener generator or whatever is creating the wave has a little hiccup or there's a little power surge or something. And the nice sine wave you get out is broken at some point in time and the phase jumps around. These phase jumps lead to essentially an incoherent beam in time. In space, uh, most of the light sources we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis are, in fact, incoherent sources. It means the, the light that's coming from different places on this filament has absolutely no phase relationship with the light from other points on the filament. And in fact, that's in the case for almost all the light sources you've ever seen in your life, with the exception of lasers. Because What's happening at one point on the source, one microscopically small point on a light bulb filament or within an LED, the, the phase of the light that's coming out there really has no relationship with the phase a micron or even a millimeter away from it on the source. And, and so most sources are spatially incoherent as well as temporally incoherent. Um, so let's look at the mathematics of this. Um, essentially, if we want to calculate the amplitude of a coherent source in time, that's pretty straightforward. Um, the amplitude of a coherent source by the principle of superposition. So in other words, if we take all of these waves and we want to sum them up, um, the amplitude simply sums this as the, the sum of all the waves. If we have four waves, each with amplitude one, um, in is going to be, the amplitude is going to be four. And that's the principle of superposition you should have encountered in your fields class. What's kind of interesting, though, is if, of course, we calculate this, um, for coherent waves, the power is proportional to the number of waves squared. So if we have two waves, the power is 4, given their amplitude is 1. If we have four coherent waves, the power will be 16. If we have eight coherent waves, the power will be 64. It goes as the square of the number of waves that we sum. However, in incoherent sources, the amplitude is essentially proportional to the square root of the number of waves we sum. And you say, oh, whoa, wait a minute. This doesn't make any sense at all, because I know if I sum a bunch of sine waves with random phase, sometimes they'll give me positive values, sometimes they'll give me negative values, and the overall sum is going to be zero. That, that's obvious to me. But in fact, it's not. And you can do this experiment numerically if, yourself if you want to, or you can learn about this in your signals class. But if you sum in sine waves with random phase, the overall amplitude will be the square proportional to the square root of the number of waves you sum. And this really makes sense if you think about it, because if I talk about independent waves, each carrying a little bit of energy or power coming from different points on the filament, and I have a longer filament and I sum up more, I would expect the power to add linearly. 
The power, of course, is proportional to the amplitude squared, and that's proportional to the number of waves that I have. And so in order for the power to match up, for energy to be conserved, um, you have to have your amplitude be proportional to the square root of n. It certainly wouldn't make any sense for you to turn on a light bulb and then double the length of the filament. The, the light would get darker, the power would stay at zero. Uh, if that was the case, uh, we couldn't transmit power through space and light wouldn't work. And so in fact, uh, let me run through this one more time and get a different color of ink and erase all my lines because this is an important point and I want to I want to bring it home a little bit. For coherent waves, the amplitude sums as the number of waves, the power sums as the number of waves squared. For incoherent sources, the amplitude sums the square root of the number of waves, which is counterintuitive, but it's really true, and the power, of course, sums as the number of waves you add, because each of these waves does carry a fixed amount of power, and energy is conserved. Let me point out a relationship here, uh, just at the end of the lecture, between the uncertainty principle, the change in frequency of wave, and coherence. Notice that's what's happening. Again, let's get a different color of ink. Notice that what's happening is that at each of these points in time where there's a phase variation of the wave, um, the phase changes. Notice that the change of phase with time, if we take the derivative of phase, is in fact equal to the radial frequency. All that frequency is, is the time derivative of the phase. And since essentially every time you have a, a sharp change in the derivative of the phase here, this results in a broadening of the frequency. And so delta omega, the uncertainty in frequency, can come from incoherent waves and their phase changes. And we'll be covering this much later in the semester when we start to talk about line broadening mechanisms and lasers. Um, but hopefully this has given you a little bit of insight into uncertainty and coherence um, and explains some of the things that are perhaps non-intuitive about this.